Hello and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast titled Immune Cell Organisation in the Lupus Kidney. My name is Jay Shane Carpen and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by Advanced Cell Diagnostics. We'll begin the webcast with presentations from Dr. Paul Hoover of Harvard Medical School and Dr. Courtney Anderson of Advanced Cell Diagnostics. We'll then end with a Q&A session. To ask a question, all you need to do is type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit at any point during the webcast and then we will answer them today. And now over to Paul. So just bear with us while uh, Paul joins. Uh, we're just having a few technical issues at the moment, uh, but we'll be with you with Paul's presentation in a second or so. Okay, just want to confirm that I can, you can hear me? This is Paul Hoover. Hi Paul, yes, you're coming in through loud and clear. Uh, I think if you can sort of uh, start your presentation and perhaps um, if you uh, say next slide, uh, I'm sure we can move the slides on for you. Great, thanks. So my name is Paul Hoover and I'm a, an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm also a postdoctoral associate in the laboratory of Nira Cohen at Broad Institute. And today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the work we've done um, looking at monocyte organization in human lupus kidney tissue. Today I'll begin by discussing a little bit of a background on lupus, talk about some of the cell types that have been discovered recently in lupus kidney, and then go into discuss how we've started to validate those cell types and begin mapping those. So I'd like to begin by just um, informing the audience and uh, that lupus kidney, kidney disease is a common and sometimes fatal complication of systemic lupus. Uh, systemic lupus affects um, between 160 to 322,000 adults in the United States. And the kidney disease compart, a component of it uh, affects about 40% of those patients. And those that are affected are primarily ethnic minorities in the United States, especially African Americans. And it's important to recognize that these patients are most likely to develop end-stage renal disease. And patients who have lupus kidney disease, and especially those with end-stage renal disease, are more likely to die than those with systemic lupus. So again, the key here is that there are there's systemic lupus, and then there's a component of that which affects just the, or mostly the kidneys. So a key point to make is that in order to diagnose lupus kidney disease, that a patient generally presents with uh, typical symptoms, but then 
the patient ultimately has to undergo a biopsy. And the biopsy is very important clinically uh, because it determines the different types of um, um, medications that are used downstream. Uh, up in the left-hand corner, this is just a reminder uh, that the patient actually has to undergo a biopsy. And on the right-hand side, this is a typical H&E slide uh, showing what the biopsy actually looks like and what a pathologist might see. And on the lower left-hand side, you can see a glomerulus. And this is the a key, this is just a schematic of uh, what the glomerulus looks like uh, to point out some important structures. Um, so uh, on the right-hand side where the H&E stain is, you can see that there is uh, the glomerular structure. Um, there are uh, disease features, in particular something called a crescent, and around that crescent there's interstitial inflammation. There are also tubules around um, uh, within the kidney. And some of these are disease-specific, some of these are not so much. But an important feature um, of the classification scheme is that the classification structure of lupus nephritis really focuses on just the glomerulus, although there's been many studies that, that have looked at other features. But it's important to note that this glomerular structure that's uh, indicated here in this red circle, uh, the histopathologic features of it help to distinguish between different classes of lupus nephritis or lupus kidney disease. And these classes are class one, class two, three, and four. These are the most common, and of these, class four is the most deadly. Down below, what you see is a small, um, a, uh, basically it's a capillary structure, and this is just a small blow up of one of these small little dots, or um, it kind of looks like small bubbles uh, uh, in the glomerulus. But inside, you can see a disorganization uh, of cells that increases as a function of the class. And these are the different types of diseases or class, disease classes that are used in order to distinguish uh, what type of uh, medication that's gonna be used for patients. So while you know, pathologically and in, in, the, in the clinic we tend to use that, uh, mostly the glomerulus, there are lots of other information beyond just the glomerular architecture. And as I pointed out earlier, Around the glomerular structure, there's something called the crescent, which is very useful. That's also part of the classification system. But most notably, there's a lot of interstitial inflammation, and those are those dense blue dots uh, that you can see. Those are all infiltrating leukocytes. In addition, there's the structure of the tubules, the shapes of those, amongst uh, other features. An important point here is that the interstitial inflammation, the extent of it has actually been quantified and found to correlate with uh, disease outcomes. So in, from a paper uh, in Kidney International by you et al., what these authors did was they had taken uh, pro approximately 300 patients and they had uh, scored their uh, kidney biopsies. And the, starting at score zero through three, so zero, one, two, and three, the increasing score uh, was reflected a greater extent of interstitial inflammation. Then they plotted the probability of renal survival as a function of follow-up time. And what they found was that the extent of interstitial inflammation seemed to increase as, or sorry, uh, dropped uh, pretty rapidly um, uh, with uh, higher scores. So in other words, the worse the inflammation, the worse you are off in terms of the uh, renal probability. So in addition to the interstitial inflammation, there are also features of the kidney tissue that we won't uh, necessarily go into detail today, but it is an interesting, uh, uh, you can see that there is a, uh, uh, basically a, um, a concordance between these two graphs and that there's uh, interstitial inflammation and tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. And uh, the worse the tubular atrophy and fibrosis are, the worse the probability of renal survival are. I mean, it's, it could suggest possibly that there is a relationship between the interstitial inflammation and kidney tissue. So um, an important uh, component of uh, past studies have been that immune cells are organized in lupus. And if you were to take this particular biopsy from this patient um, that we've been taking care of and you were to stain it for uh, some of the major cell classes, you'll find that there is a discrete um, organization. And in particular, this is stained, this FFPE sample is stained with um, T cell markers, B cell markers, and myeloid cell markers. And those are indicated on the right-hand corner. 
But what you'll notice is that uh, the glomerulus seems to have um, myeloid cells that seem to be differentially localized to it, and the other cell types are excluded from that. That's not necessarily a novel finding, but it does uh, support the idea that there is a strict organization within um, the lupus kidney. You can also see that there is a, a, an exclusion of uh, many immune cell types from the crescentic areas as well. What people have done in the past is taken a look at um, different cell types as a function of the uh, physical or anatomic location in the kidney. And so this is a paper that was published many years ago, uh, but it still speaks to the heart of the t uh, immune cell organization. These are some of the very first studies that began to look at these sorts of questions. So, um, and the, the, the interstitial cells, uh, which are the spaces between the tubular structures, uh, they these authors had stained for different cell types, including T cells, uh, T helper cells, cytotoxic cells, and monocytes. And what they found is that the interstitial space seems to be enriched for um, T cells. Um, conversely, when they look at just the glomerular structures, they found that these are enriched for um, a myeloid or a monocytic uh, cell type in particular. So this underscores the idea that uh, even at this coarse level where we don't have cell subsets, but we do have major cell lineages, that they seem to be differentially localized uh, in lupus kidney. And in particular, when you start to go, uh, uh, drill down on different types of uh, cell types that are in fact localized, um, and you were to look at something called the M2-like macrophages, these are repair types of macrophages, um, these authors tried to use a single marker uh, to understand the distribution of those cell types in the different classes of lupus kidney. And what you see is that there is a difference between um, uh, these helper cells, or sorry, these M2-like macrophages in different classes of lupus kidney. And that also holds true in the interstitial spaces as well. So you have glomerular distribution and interstitial distribution of the cell uh, subset specifically. And importantly, this actually, the infiltration of this particular subset of m 2 like macrophages correlates with renal fibrosis. And it has been well established that renal fibrosis is a um, strong indicator um, for a uh, prognostic indicator for a renal outcome. So the extent of renal fibrosis, right here, which is on the y axis right here, seems to uh, correspond to the, or depend upon the, the amount of CD1 73 these um, infiltration, m 2 like macrophage infiltration. So to summarize the background, I think it's important to point out take on the, 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 the number one message. So number one is that these glomerular structures that diagnose or would prove to get a diagnosis. There's a lot of other indices, there's a lot of other kind of pathological features that are not only used reviewed somewhat, um, that we reviewed somewhat. Um, the immune cells, and especially the modern immune cells, are associated with the immune cells that seem to be in the region. This has been well known in this kidney and the other cells that are present in the gut. And 
In summary, this, there was approximately 20 patients that were enrolled in the very first study, um, and this paper is uh, in press at Nature Immunology. Um, but what was found was that there are 21 immune cell types in lupus kidney that are mostly absent from healthy kidneys. And these span a different, many ranges of uh, cell subtypes. So the resolution here is unprecedented in the t terms of the uh, cell subsets that we see. Um, we see T cells, uh, many different types of B cells, but in particular, today we're going to be focusing on the myeloid cells and a subset of those myeloid cells, the monocytes. And what I would say about all of these cell types is that the, you know we are, these are very different than what we see in a healthy kidney, so we can assume that these are the active states of the cells, and so that's an important point. And as we uh, begin to look at in more depth um, these different monocyte cell states, and we ask, are these could these actually be related? For example, is it possible that one mon uh, monocyte enters um, and then transitions uh, into subsets? Um, uh, we would want to know that in particular because uh, that might actually prove um, a point in which we could actually target for therapy. So uh, an analysis that was done was something called diffusion mapping, and basically the transcriptomes are uh, placed in order uh, according to their likeness. And um, basically you see whether uh, those transcriptomes order in a way that would suggest that they uh, undergo state transitions. And what we find is uh, that the monocytes one, uh, two, and three seem to actually undergo, um, at least they order, and it suggests that they could potentially undergo transition states in tissue. And so that's part of the uh, the basis for the hypothesis that we're, you know, that I'm interested in testing, and that uh, basically the monocyte one, two, and three that seem to be related, and the uh, the hypothesis of the tissue microenvironment drives the monocyte state transitions. And so an important prediction as part of this model would be that the monocyte states localize to discrete renal part, uh, compartments. So as we go back to the outline in terms of the rest of the talk, I wanted to discuss how we combine the single SARNI sequencing with imaging to validate and then map our cell types in clinically annotated tissue. And uh, the basic strategy that we take in order to map is we have to convert our single cell sequencing signature into cell-specific markers. And this is important um, to be able to have the ability to stain for RNA. Um, and in particular, because all of our these clusters um, are defined by uh, transcriptomes and RNA, we will need to be able to stain for those specifically. And what we want to be able to do is utilize something called the discriminatory gene sets. These are the genes that actually help distinguish each, each cell cluster from one another. Here we have an example of those, um, what the discriminatory gene sets look like at kind of a macroscopic level. Um, basically, this is a giant heat, this is a, you know, a, a heat map that's been shrunk down, but there are um, genes um, in the rows uh, in every cell. Uh, every column is a cell. And if you were to, uh, un in an unbiased manner, basically ask which ones are most similar, uh, you have a clustering mechanism by which uh, that reveals different cell subsets. And so the different colors that you see over on the myeloid cells, those are represented uh, in this heat map here. So there are five different myeloid cell subsets. And these uh, yellow markers indicate uh, the different genes that have been um, unique to that particular subset. And so those are the genes that we want to be able to stain for. And so it's important not to be restricted to proteins, but really to be able to stain for RNA. So in terms of this, um, what we've done is a, uh, identified a myeloid marker. I haven't listed it here because these data are still unpublished, but the myeloid marker that we have chosen um, is an excellent marker that is able to, um, that is expressed in all the different myeloid cell subsets. From there, we then look for a combination of markers that will distinguish subset one, two, and three. And so we're able to identify different uh, myeloid markers uh, for the, and, and monocyte subset markers that will capture um, just subset one um, and subset two or subset three. And in order to uh, stain, what we would do is we take tissue blocks that are archived um, from our hospital. Uh, and these are formalin, paraffin embedded 
um, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, and the reason is because these retain superior morphology. We basically section and stain these uh, for the different panels. And we also get an H and E stain so that we can understand some of the architecture. And then we use a, um, a slide scanner that has pretty good resolution and is high speed. So we're basically able to capture entire sections and image the entire biopsy. We then do some image processing overlay uh, and analysis. I did want to point out that the reason we are interested mostly in FFPE um, is because it retains superior morphology. If we're trying to identify where cell types are in tissue, it's pretty important uh, to have a good morphological um, retention. And so FFP is that the second advantage of this is that it's archived. So there's so much of it uh, in, our, in our hospital that we're able to obtain. And thirdly, these archived tissues are clinically annotated. So if we do end up staining enough uh, patient samples, uh, we would hope to correlate our, you know, our, uh, our, our findings in tissue to clinical uh, variables. In contrast, on the right, this is a frozen OCT section. And you can see that a lot of the architecture is destroyed when you, um, uh, when you freeze the tissue. The reason this is relevant is because many of the other tissues are stained um, using frozen OCT. So the next slide, I'm going to be showing some of our data sets uh, that help establish um, the different cell types. So um, this, so I'm going to walk you through um, what's on the left-hand side, So on the, and then we'll go to the right. But on the left-hand side, this is a blow-up of single-cell RNA sequencing clusters. And on the top left, uh, in the green box, these are the myeloid cells. And the green arrow is just to remind us that we have now converted what we found in the single cell RNA cluster into just a single gene. And now we're just staining for that single gene. And on the right-hand side, in all these images, these are basically uh, tissue that have been stained for specific genes. So that's the green. Those are, that's the myeloid marker. Right below it, we have a monocyte marker, a monocyte 1. And we have stained for that monocyte 1 marker. And um, on the right, the large picture overall, uh, this is a merge of all of the uh, myeloid, the monocyte, and the nuclei, or the DAPI staining. And what I'd like to show you is basically in the middle of the image, you can see that there's monocyte 1 cells. And these are um, uh, cells that express at high levels the myeloid lineage marker, which is the, you know just to basically capture that major lineage, and then we can subset it. Uh, by staining specifically for the monocyte. So the fact that we have two markers, one that distinguishes the lineage and another marker that distinguishes the subset, we can have high confidence that we are indeed identifying the cell types that we are interested in actually finding. In the right-hand side over here, these are cells um, that are expressing just the myeloid marker. So we're not able to distinguish what myeloid subset they are amongst the other um, four, um, but we do know that they are myeloid cells. So we basically uh, did this for the different, the three different subsets. I won't show you um, all of the uh, of the examples here due to time constraints, um, but basically we were able to find uh, each of the monocyte subsets um, in several patients, and in that way we felt uh, reasonably confident that we were um, identifying or using single single cell RNA sequencing uh, to help. Um, uh, figure out new clusters of cells, new cell types, and then going back into tissue to help validate those cells. So the next part uh, I would like to talk about is how we began mapping those monocyte subsets in clinically annotated tissue. And so now we have basically developed a method to reliably detect uh, the cell types uh, of our interest in clinically annotated tissue. So we wanted to begin scaling up. And as I had mentioned before, we like to image um, whole kidney biopsy sections um, with our cell-specific RNA probes. And the rationale before imaging uh, the entire section is so that we can um, have all the spatialized context. And in the next slide, you can see there's a small little box in the middle here. And in the next slide, we're going to zoom in on that box so you can see some of the, the detail that uh, we're getting. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, 
Right, so this is a, a blow up of that box. And on the top hand side, you can see a raw image and you can see the myeloid uh, staining and there's small dots. These are fish spots uh, using the ACD probes. Um, there's also the monocyte one spots. Um, you can imagine that staining an entire piece of uh, section and trying to identify you know, what spots co-localize uh, can be tricky. And it is uh, indeed, it is a challenge. Uh, so the most the most challenging aspect is being able to classify cells across a large area of tissues for quantitation. And so what we do for that is uh, we turn to um, our imaging core partners um, at Broad Institute um, and and others, um, and we're able to computationally segment uh, each nucleus. We then dilate the nucleus. Um, uh, by just a, a few microns, and that will presumably represent the cell borders. Now, these are just estimates. And then from within the cell borders, uh, we look for those fish spots. Um, we get a combination of those fish spots, and then we're able to uh, assign our cell type um, within the spatialized context. And so we've done that using different types of software. Um, and uh, what I'll present to you next is some of the, uh, the summary of what we have found in terms of looking for those monocyte subsets across tissue. So before we go into that summary, I just wanted to remind you again exactly what we would be looking for. On the left-hand side, this is a picture uh, of the nephron, and we're going to be looking for how those monocytes uh, basically relate uh, to those structures of the nephron. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the monocyte enrichments in um, four different compartments. First is um, the glomerular structure that's in the in the top. Uh, there's a crescentic uh, uh, area, which is um, uh, in this dotted area. Um, and then there's a tubular interstitial, interstitial space as well. And when we begin to look at uh, 10 biopsies with uh, the most severe form of, of lupus kidney disease, class 4, that are undergoing their first biopsy, um, here is what we end up finding. Um, this is a heat map. And so the idea here is that uh, the warmer the color, uh, the, the more the higher the enrichment score, and the enrichment score is calculated by looking at the fraction of the compartment occupied by uh, one particular cell type. And so we are looking at monocyte type one, and in particular the non-crescentic glomerulus. And what we find is that those um, cell types seem to be preferentially localized there in this particular uh, subset of lupus patients um, versus um, the tubular interstitial space. When we look at the second uh, monocyte cell type, uh, we find that, uh, again, they are in the non-crescentic glomerulus, the crescentic glomerulus, as well as the crescent, uh, but this time they're not, uh, again, they're not in the tubular interstitial space. And the monocyte state three, we find, is actually outside of, um, of the glomerulus, uh, or it prefers to be outside of the glomerulus altogether. It seems to be enriched in this tubular interstitial space. So uh, if you were to combine our first, uh, you know, the first part uh, of the data aspect of this talk, um, you know, we feel like we have a reasonably uh, robust method of, uh, of validating cell types in tissue. Um, and it leads us to a model. Um, if we were to look at the transcriptome of monocyte ones relative to blood monocytes, we find that they are actually pretty similar. And as a result, we come up with this. Uh, we find, uh, a potential model is that monocytes one enter from the blood into the glomerular space, that they may differentiate into tissue, um, and then they end up migrating out in the tubular interstitial space. Um, and to summarize, uh, you know, we have monocyte states that are predicted by our single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, we've been able to identify those in a patient cohort of lupus nephritis that are separate from that initial patient cohort. So we feel like this is uh, decent uh, data to or, or to support um, those monocyte states, um, and we find that they're differentially localized, suggesting that uh, those are um, that these monocyte cells are indeed uh, highly organized in tissue. Um, and in terms of our next steps, we're in the process of um, looking for additional cell types and then scaling up to uh, look at um, you know dozens, um, if not a, a hundred or so patients. Um, and with that, I'll uh, turn it over. Excellent. Thank you for your presentation, Paul. And uh, now over to Courtney for her presentation. Okay, great. 
Uh, thank you very much, Jay Sean, and also to Dr. Hoover for that fantastic presentation. Uh, now I'd like to discuss, oops, jumped a little bit ahead. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to discuss the RNA scope technology that uh, Dr. Hoover showcased in his presentation and show how you can uh, validate and spatially map single cell RNA sequencing data, as well as data related to immune and kidney research uh, in the tissue context using this technology. So complex, highly heterogeneous tissues, such as the brain, tumors, and kidney, as well as processes such as embryonic development, are comprised of multiple cell types and states. And precise characterization of these tissues can enable identification of new cell types, uh, predictive biomarkers, uh, new therapeutic strategies, and more. However, interrogation of these complex, heterogeneous tissues requires a highly sensitive, specific, and multiplex spatial approach with single cell resolution. And that's where the RNA scope technology comes in. It's an ideal solution to really interrogate these complex tissues. It's a highly specific and sensitive method to detect RNA biomarkers in cells and tissues with morphological context and at the single cell level. And it consists of three parts. First, there's a unique target probe that ACD designs against your sequence of interest. There is a signal amplification system that generates a high signal to noise ratio and lastly, visualization of single RNA molecules as dots. The assay allows for the spatial mapping of messenger RNA, non-coding RNA, splice variants, and highly homologous sequences in cells and intact tissues, all of which can be visualized with either fluorescent or chromogenic labels. And the assay can be performed on a wide variety of sample types, including FFPE tissues, fresh frozen or fixed frozen tissues, uh, PBMCs, and cultured cells. <coughs> And now I just want to go over uh, the technology in just a little bit of detail. The two key features of the RNA scope technology are its probe design and the signal amplification. The oligonucleotide target specific probes are depicted as these to emphasize the fact that they have two regions linked by a spacer. The bottom of the Z complements and hybridizes to the target transcript, while the top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. When two Zs hybridize in tandem to the target sequence, it creates a binding site upon which a preamplifier can bind and the amplification tree can be built. After the two uh, Z pairs uh, hybridize with the target RNA, oops, oh, apologize. There we go. <laughs> uh, then the preamplifier can bind to the top of the ZZ pair, and then each preamplifier can bind multiple amplifiers. And then each amplifier can further bind multiple labeled probes. Labeled probes contain either a chromogenic enzyme or a fluorophore. This signal amplification strategy yields high sensitivity and allows for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot, where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule that can be quantified. So that's how we achieve sensitivity. Uh, in order to eliminate uh, background, the signal is dependent on two Zs binding next to each other on the target sequence. If both Zs do not bind next to each other, then the preamplifier cannot form a stable hybridization and the amplification tree does not get built. Consequently, no amplification of nonspecific hybridization occurs, generating little to no background signal. And the standard RNA scope probe will consist of approximately 20 Z pairs pooled together that are designed to hybridize next to each other along a target region, allowing for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, a minimum of only three Z pairs is needed to bind to the target RNA sequence in order to generate enough signal for molecular detection. Taken together, this combination of probe design and signal amplification ensures a high signal-to-noise ratio. The RNA scope technology offers two main assays to detect numerous types of RNA species in the tissue context at single molecule sensitivity with single cell resolution. The RNA scope assay, which is applicable for messenger RNA or non-coding RNAs that are greater than 300 nucleotides in length. And then we also have the base scope assay, which is specific for exon junctions, splice variants, and highly homologous or short sequences. The RNA scope assay can be performed with up to two targets chromogenically or four targets fluorescently. In addition, it can be performed manually or in automated stainers from Leica and Ventana. The base scope assay can be performed with up to two targets chromogenically. The singleplex assay can be performed manually or in automated stainers from Leica and Ventana, while the duplex assay is currently available as a manual protocol. 
So now I'd like to show some examples of how the RNA scope technology has been applied in the kidney research field. Uromodulin, the most abundant protein in normal urine, is exclusively expressed in the kidney. Early studies established that uromodulin is essentially produced by the cells lining the thick ascending limb, but conflicting reports suggested that uromodulin may also be expressed in the distal convoluted tubule, where its role remains unknown. These authors used RNA-scope-ish to resolve these conflicting reports. They observed abundant uromodulin signal, shown here in green, in the um, ascending limb, uh, which co-localized with the TAL marker SLC12A1. However, uromodulin signal was also observed in the DCT, or the distal convoluted tubule, and co-localized with the DCT marker SLC12A3, shown in blue. These data demonstrate specific expression of uromodulin along the, um, the thick ascending limb and also the distal convoluted tubule. Clotho is a type 1 membrane protein predominantly produced in the kidney, but its extracellular domain is secreted into the systemic circulation. Previous studies have shown that membranous and secreted clotho protect against several forms of renal injury and progression of kidney disease, as well as ameliorate proteinuria. But whether and how clotho directly protects the podocytes and the glomerular filter is unknown. These authors use the RNA scope duplex assay to determine whether clotho is expressed in podocytes or other cell types in the glomerulus. They found clotho to be expressed in podocytes of the glomerulus, albeit at much lower levels than in the distal tubules. And that's what's shown here in the images on the right. Overall, this study provided compelling evidence to support the notion that clotho plays a direct role in protecting podocytes from injury. FGS 23 is a factor that is secreted by osteoclasts during homeostasis, but it can be induced by other cells and organs due to injury. These authors examined the role of FGF23 during kidney injury by using the RE scope assay to identify which cells expressed FGF23 in kidneys from injured or uninjured rats. They found that FGF23 was exclusively detected in the interstitial space of the injured kidneys, as you can see here, indicated by the red signal. The mammalian kidney develops through reciprocal inductive signals between the metanephric mesenchyme and ureter butter, uh, bud. Transcription factor 21, or TCF21, is highly expressed in the metanephric mesenchyme, but its role in kidney development has been precluded due to embryonic lethality of whole body TCF21 deletion from severe renal hyperplasia. These authors conditionally deleted TCF21 using a multitude of methods, to show that TCF21 regulates key molecular pathways required for the branching morphogenesis. RNA scope ish revealed that a particular uh, key pathway, the GDNF RET WINT11 access, is required for branching morphogenesis is, and is downregulated in the absence of TCF21 in the kidney. Uh, and that's whether it's uh, deleted from the entire kidney, which is shown here um, in these uh, two columns on the left or if it was specifically deleted in the renal stroma, which is shown in the two columns on the right. toll like receptors are sensors of danger signals which promote the activation of immune cells and intrinsic renal cells. Podocytes are continuously exposed to various plasma solutes and danger signals due to their unique location in the glomerulus. These authors use the RNA scope ish assay to show that the toll like receptor TLR9 is overexpressed in the glomeruli of a mouse model called YAA of the autoimmune disease membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis at six months of age. Given the quantifiable nature of the RNA scope dots, they also quantified the number of Tolec receptor 9 dots in the kidney, confirming the greater expression of PLR9 in YAA mice compared to control mice. Mutation of the gene HNF1B is one cause of an autosomal dominant tubulo interstitial kidney disease. This is characterized by renal fibrosis, tubular cysts, and progressive decline in renal function. But the mechanism whereby mutated HNF1B leads to tubulo interstitial fibrosis in HNF1 beta mutant kidneys uh, is still not known. So these authors used RNA scope to show that aberrant signaling, TGF beta signaling, uh, underlies this interstitial fibrosis in these mutant kidneys. They found that specifically TGF beta 2 
and TGF beta 3 were strongly expressed in the cyst epithelium of HNF1 beta mutant kidneys compared to the wild type kidneys. The last example I wanted to show for kidney research is this really interesting paper that came out that uh, examined a parvovirus that actually results in kidney disease. The occurrence of a spontaneous nephropathy with intranuclear inclusions in laboratory mice has puzzled pathologists for over four decades because its etiology had remained elusive. Using metagenomics, these authors identified the causative agent as an atypical virus, which they termed mouse kidney parvovirus, or MKPV, which belongs to a diversion genus of parvovirdaea. MKPV is a kidney parvovirus that has been found in multiple laboratory mouse colonies and causes spontaneous nephropathy, but now could represent a new tool for studying uh, chronic kidney disease. RNA scope was used to localize the MKPV sequences to tubular epithelial cells in the mouse kidney. And as you can see here, an abundance of MKPV sequences were detected uh, that correlated with histological disease severity, while there was no detection of MKPV nucleic acids in unaffected mice. Now, the RNA scope assay is also an ideal tool for really trying to characterize the immune infiltration in any tissue, since the assay can detect the cellular source of key immune cytokines and chemokines. In order to assess the infiltration of selected lymphoid and myeloid cell populations, here we're showing a lung cancer example, the expression of several key functional markers, such as FOXP3, interferon gamma, the chemokines CXCL10 and CCL22, were evaluated in addition to key cell lineage markers, CD4, CD8, CD68, and CD163. In the highly inflamed core shown on the top, we observed abundant infiltration of both lymphoid and myeloid cells, including cytotoxic T lymphocytes, regulatory T cells, M1 macrophages, and alternatively activated M2 macrophages. Now, a great way to help further characterize cellular gene expression is to combine ISH with IHC on the same slide to simultaneously detect RNA and protein. What we refer to as dual ISH IHC can be used to characterize cell type specific expression, identify origin of secreted proteins, visualize cell surface markers with RNA of interest, visualize RNA binding proteins and their target RNA, and dissect regulation of gene expression. Because of the similar workflows between ISH and IHC, um, including sample fixation, pretreatment, uh, and signal detection, as well as the unique benefits of each assay, as I just described, ISH and IHC are ideal to combine into one workflow in which the RNA scope ISH assay is performed first, followed by the IHC assay. Uh, we do have some recommendations to uh, help enable success with your assay. First, all dual ISH IHC protocols do require optimization. In general, it's recommended to combine a working RNA scope protocol with a working IHC protocol. In addition, work with antibodies and a protocol that are known and already established uh, with your tissue samples. Second, it's advisable to perform ISH first, followed by IHC. Third, uh, you should optimize the IHC assay separately using the RNA scope pretreatment reagents to ensure your protein can still be detected following RNA scope pretreatment. And lastly, the dual-ish IHC assay works better for highly expressed proteins due to protease treatment um, that is used during the ISH protocol. In this example, we apply the dual-ish IHC assay to thoroughly characterize immune infiltration of lymphoid cells and their state in a lung cancer sample. CD4, FOXP3, and interferon gamma mRNAs were all detected by RNA scope, followed by detection of CD8 protein by IHC or IF in this case, since it was fluorescence. CD4, FOXP3, dual positive T regulatory cells are indicated by the green arrows, whereas CD8 interferon gamma double positive cytotoxic T lymphocytes are indicated by the red arrows. And in this image, we can capture both of those cell populations using this dual-ish IHC assay. Now here's an example, gamma delta T cells are considered unconventional T cells defined, defined by expression of heterodynamic T cell receptors, uh, which are composed of both the gamma and the delta chains. Melandri et al. show that individual gamma delta T cell receptors have the intrinsic ability to combine innate immunity and adaptive immunity. 
The Arniscope ISH assay demonstrated that human colonic gamma delta T cells localized mainly to the intraepithelial lymphocyte compartment and in human colon. And this work even made the cover of Nature Immunology last year. Now I wanted you to switch gears a little bit and focus on the single cell capabilities of the RNA scope technology. Initiatives such as the Human Cell Atlas require assessing gene expression at the single cell level. However, current single cell transcriptomic studies utilize dissociated cells and result in the loss of spatial organization of the cell population. Validation and spatial mapping of single cell analyses can be obtained using assays that retain special or organization, such as RNA-ish. The RNA scope technology is a robust, highly specific and sensitive ish methodology with the multiplexing capabilities to allow validation and provide spatial information for high throughput single cell transcriptomic results. This technology allows for cell type specific expression profiles to be mapped back to the complex tissue context of organs. And some applications of this include a spatial mapping of a cell atlas, visualization of gene signatures of newly identified cell types, classification of highly heterogeneous cell types, confirmation of new therapeutic cell types, characterization of the immune landscape, identification of new immunotherapy targets, analysis or prediction of drug treatment responses, and confirmation of publicly available data sets such as the TCGA. Now, single cell profiling has been widely applied to interrogate the highly heterogeneous tumor microenvironment. Tumor subclasses differ according to the genotypes and phenotypes of malignant cells, as well as the composition of the tumor microenvironment. Researchers from Aviv Regev's lab at the Broad Institute dissected these cell types in IDH mutant gliomas by combining single cell RNA sequencing profiles of more than 14,000 cells from 16 patients with bulk RNA seq profiles from 165 glioma patients. They found the differences between IDH mutant gliomas were primarily due to the distinct cellular and genetic composition of the tumor microenvironment, and then an increase in macrophage over microglia expression programs in the tumor microenvironment as tumor grade progresses. RNA-scope-ish confirmed these results and localized specific cell subtypes in the tumor microenvironment to demonstrate that intertumor variability in the microglia or macrophage state was correlated with glioma grade. Higher grade tumors were preferentially associated with macrophage-like expression states, whereas lower grade tumors either had a mix of macrophage-like or microglia-like cells, or little to no macrophages or microglia. And by shedding light on the cellular composition of IDH mutant gliomas, these data could aid in the design of immunotherapies targeting gliomas. Single cell profiling has also been applied to uncover new cell types, allowing for the creation of whole organ cell atlases. Researchers from Stan Linerson's lab at the Karolinska Institute created a molecular survey on the mouse nervous system. They analyzed 19 regions from the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and enteric nervous system by single cell RNA sequencing, totaling more than 500,000 cells, and created a taxonomy of all identified cell types shown here on the bottom right. An RNA scope was used to validate the identity and spatial diversity of many cell types uh, identified in this study. And here we're just showing a snapshot of some of those representative data. This is another very nice study, also from the Karolinska Institute, that spatially mapped multiple gene signatures that were identified by single cell RNA sequencing. 15 molecular subtypes of excitatory neurons and 15 molecular subtypes of inhibitory neurons in the spinal cord were revealed. RNA scope was used to not only validate the gene signatures of all 30 subtypes, but also to create a spatial map of these neurons in the cervical spinal cord. Single cell transcriptional profiling has also aided in the identification of new cell types with therapeutic potential. Until now, researchers lacked the technological capability to discern exactly which cells harbor the mutated proteins that lead to cystic fibrosis. Two studies back-to-back -back in Nature last year identified a new airway epithelial cell type that expresses the CFTR gene, which encodes the protein that is mutated in cystic fibrosis, and term this new cell type the FOXI1 positive, CFTR positive pulmonary ionocyte. RNA scope is used in both of these studies, and here I'm showing just one of them for the sake of time. Upon identifying this rare ionocyte cell population by single cell RNA seq, 
RNA scope confirmed the presence of the Fox I1 CFTR dual positive cell type in both mouse and human airway epithelium. These data suggest that the pulmonary ionocyte is the major sor source of CFTR activity in the airway epithelium. Identification of this ionocyte in normal human lung could aid in identifying the appropriate cellular target for cystic fibrosis gene therapies. Now, the last section I just wanted to touch upon is uh, splice variants. So, complex um, uh, tissue heterogeneity can really arise from these splice variants. It's how you can really create a lot of cellular diversity. Through alternative splicing, which can lead to a variety of combinations of exon inclusion or exclusion, a single gene can encode multiple proteins to increase diversity and cellular heterogeneity. However, detection of splice variants in the tissue context has been limited due to lack of highly specific tools. Therefore, we created the base scope assay to now detect splice variants with morphological context. And just an example, I'm showing EGFR V3, which is a splice variant that arises from a gain of function mutation, causing an in frame genomic deletion of exons 2 to 7 and leading to constitutively active oncogenic signaling. It's the most frequent mutation found in glioblastoma patients. Detection of EGFR V3 in FFPE clinical specimens by IHC and real time uh, PCR approaches have been developed but are suboptimal due to the lack of specificity and spatial resolution, respectively. Therefore, we use the base scope assay to identify EGFR V3 status within the tumor morphological context. One ZZ pair probes were designed to span the exon junctions in order to detect either wild type, mutant, or both transcripts. The wild type probes uh, span the junctions of either exons 1 and 2 or exons 7 and 8, while the EGFR V3 specific probes span the junction of exons 1 and 8. In this slide, we show two glioblastoma cases staining with the probes I just described. With both wild-type probes, we see staining in both cases, indicating both express wild-type EGFR. However, with the mutant probe, we only see signal in the case on the left, indicating that this case is positive for the EGFR V3 variant, while the case on the right is not. Taken together, we can identify EGFR V3 status in situ in FFPE glioblastoma samples. So in summary, RNA scope uses a unique probe design strategy to dramatically improve signal to noise ratio. We currently have over 15,000 catalogs, uh, probes on catalog, uh, but any new probes can be designed and made within two weeks for any target and any species. RNA scope provides both quantitative and spatial information on your targets in the complex tissue environment at single cell resolution. The newest assay base scope can detect splicing variants and short sequences down to approximately 50 nucleotides. And the RNA scope assays can be complemented by IHC or IF for si simultaneous RNA and protein detection on the same slide. The growth and adoption of the RNA scope technology is best exemplified by the number of peer reviewed publications. We had our first publication in 2011, and since then, there have been over 2,000 peer reviewed papers published using the RNA scope technology in numerous journals, including many top tier ones. And the RNA scope assay is highly relevant across multiple fields of research, with over 40% of the publications in cancer research, followed closely by neuroscience and infectious diseases. If you would like more information on the RNA scope technology or any further application uh, related information, please visit us on the web at acdbio.com or contact us at the email address shown here on the screen. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you for your presentation, Courtney. It is now time for the Q&A. To ask the speakers a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. So our first question, and this one is for you, Paul, and it asks, um, do the uh, monocyte cell types you see in the um, SERNA seq data correspond to those in the literature? Right. I'm happy to answer this question. So, um, what I, I the the question being that um, do the do the monocyte cells that we are finding in the single cell RNA sequencing data um, from the dissociated tissue are these corresponding to things that are already known in the literature? 
Um, the the simple answer is that uh, no, it's it, uh, we're we're finding a lot we're finding um, a lot of nuance to this actually. It turns out if you were to take uh, markers that have been used in the literature in the past to identify cell types, and you were to look at where those markers are in our single cell data and in our cell types that we found, it turns out those markers actually are expressed in several cell types. So it raises the question that maybe old literature you're actually seeing um, multiple cell types that are marked by a single marker. Um, but it does, I think, provide uh, power for the idea that using single cell RNA-seq and then having an unbiased manner of identifying cell types and then going back into tissue to identify those cell types and validate those with a method like staining, whether it be fish or proteins, um, is a, is a uh, pretty good approach. Thanks, Paul. And our next question is for you, Courtney. Uh, and this one asks, um, you mentioned uh, running um, ISH and IHC together. Um, can you describe that a bit more? Uh, yes, sure. As I mentioned, you can combine the uh, ISH assay with IHC or with immunofluorescence, and this would be done on the same section. Um, we really do recommend performing the ISH assay first, and um, then you would follow it by the IHC or immunofluorescence assay, depending on which um, detection system you would like to use. Uh, we also really recommend using well-validated antibodies um, that you've already tested by IHC alone, uh, and also for high-expressing protein targets, since uh, for RNA-ish detection, you do have to do a protease step, which could degrade some of the protein that's in the sample. Um, also, uh, the IHC assay or IHIS can be performed on automated stainers. So you could perform these on either the Leica Bond RX or the Ventana Discovery automated stainers. Excellent. Thanks, Courtney. And our next question is for you, Paul, I think. And this one asks um, whether you can sort of talk a little bit more about um, the genes um, that you mentioned during your presentation. Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned during the presentation, the overall approach to identify those genes, um, there are several that can be taken. The first is the one that we took, and that is uh, we've used the discriminatory gene sets to identify kind of the top markers. And in particular, to identify those discriminatory genes, uh, we looked at uh, expression levels and p-values for those genes to make sure that they are very specific to that cell type. That's one method. Um, there's a second method um, that I think is either uh, on BioArchive or recently published, um, and it's called Comet. Uh, and this is done by a group um, at Farber, at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And um, what they do is they, they specifically try to identify um, what the best markers would be um, based on, uh, your, um, on your gene sets. Um, in particular for ours, unfortunately, we're not able to share the, uh, the exact genes at this point as the data, um, these, this is unpublished. So, um, uh, but we hope to, to publish it soon and to be able to share those with people. But those are some of the approaches that we took to identify the genes. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. And our next question is also for you. And this one asks, uh, what are the implications for discovering and mapping monocyte state transitions uh, or any cell type um, in tissue? Right. So um, in my presentation, we had discussed uh, you know, different anatomic locations that are enriched for different cell types. But I think really the key question is, uh, what are the monocytes or whatever cell type you're interested in, what are they doing to the tissue? And one way to begin looking at that is to begin identifying where cells are relative to tissue damage. And so that's the one phase that we're interested in, is um, I, you know mapping out these very specific cell types and then looking at the histopathological features of the tissue. For example, um, are there, is there, you know, monocyte ones, are those associated with damage? Are monocytes three, are those associated with features of repair? And those will give us um, some more mechanistic clues as to um, what we're, uh, you know, uh, more hypotheses that could then be on, uh, we could actually test. Great, thanks, Paul. And our next question asks, uh, you mentioned that you are uh, about to scale up um, this 
project, uh, possibly including more patients. Um, what um, approach will you use uh, and how will you keep costs down? Right. Uh, so what we've done in order to, so we've done what we presented today or what I talked about today was a summary from uh, 10 patients, but our goal is to actually stain um, uh, about 200 patients total to understand where monocytes and other cell types are. So uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the it, it can get expensive. And um, one way in which we do that is uh, we need to be able to do something very reproducible um, and at cost. And so we've actually turned to the a little Leica bond, which uh, Courtney had mentioned, and we um, do all of our staining on the Leica bond now. But to reduce cost, what we end up doing is we put on four patient samples onto a single slide. And in that way, we're basically staining, you know, four times the amount that we would normally stain. So we have four kidney biopsies on a single slide and the same amount of reagents are used to stain all four that would be used to stain just one. So um, that's how we're trying to achieve reproducibility and to reduce our costs. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. I would now like to thank Dr. Paul Hoover and Dr. Courtney Anderson for their presentations and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsors, Advanced Cell Diagnostics, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand on h.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.